It's, it's truly heartening to see uh, the level of interest for, for a discussion on global affairs and our very uh, special guest this afternoon. Uh, allow me to say f first a few things about uh, the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development. For those of you uh, who are with us uh, for the first time, uh, we decided to set it up as a think tank uh, back in 2013 uh, with the idea of making Belgrade a center, one of the centers of European ex understanding uh, the complexities of global politics and, uh, and world affairs. Uh, at the close of the last century, uh, Yugoslavia has unfortunately descended into ferocious internal strife. And all the successor states uh, are still arguably recovering from the deep wounds caused by the ensuing devastation. Well, back then, and I would strongly argue today as well, uh, here in Serbia, we failed to properly understand the global dynamics, and, uh, and the rest was history. Uh, so we established uh, CIRSD in late uh, 2013, in large part to help ensure that policymakers' opinion Shapers, scholars, and students uh, come to better understand the world than their predecessors. Uh, so to give us advice as uh, how to do it, we have endeavored to uh, uh, get with us a truly world class of people, including our board of advisors. And uh, our guest this afternoon is one of the founding members of the Board of Advisors of the CRSD. Uh, we've uh, made uh, numerous meetings and discussions and conferences uh, in Belgrade, but not only in Belgrade. We organized uh, big events in New York, in Washington, in Beijing, in London, in Paris, in Istanbul, and many other uh, locations. We partnered up to do so with the French Institute of Foreign Affairs, Center for American Progress in Washington, with Harvard University, uh, with London's uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies, with the Russian Academy, with the China's uh, State Councils Institute, DRC. Uh, we also published a number of books, including our guest book. Uh, our two most recent events in Belgrade featured uh, President of the Council of Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, uh, former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, Ian Bremmer, President of Eurasia Group. Um, and one other thing that I think it's worth mentioning here, because we are at a Horizons discussion, we decided to start publishing a quarterly magazine of international relations and sustainable development that is called Horizons. Uh, so in short four years, this quarterly grew into one of uh, the world's best known magazines from Southeast Europe. Uh, we featured exclusive articles of over 20 heads of state and government, present and former, over 40 ministers, 20 leaders of international organizations and international financial institutions, and uh, of course, many thought leaders many opinion makers, including Nobel Prize winners. Uh, this newest issue of Horizons, I believe, uh, is with you, and I hope you are going to like it, including Jeffrey Sachs' uh, exclusive piece uh, for the Horizons. Uh, for our work, we've uh, gotten uh, praise from many parts of the world, for which we're very grateful. Uh, recently, we also got um, an acknowledgement from our own government in Serbia, although in a very unusual way. Uh, we were called the leading international gang of thieves. So I want you to be feeling warmly welcome to the gangster's paradise 
That is the CIRSD. Welcome. Uh, now, all jokes left aside, and now uh, I have a very uh, difficult task of introducing a very special guest. <laughs> and uh, we took a, a short excerpt of his biography, but it's in uh, several pages, so I always find it very difficult to introduce Jeff. Uh, he's uh, a world-renowned professor and thinker, senior advisor to the United Nations, best-selling author and uh, prolific writer of columns that appear monthly in about 100 countries each month around the world. He was called by the New York Times probably the most important economist in the world. And a survey by The Economist of London in 2011 ranked Professor Sachs as amongst the world's three most influential living economists. He currently serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. He's also a director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network under the auspices of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He served as a senior advisor to a series of UN Secretary Generals starting with Kofi Annan, then Ban Ki-moon, and now Antonio Guterres. He authored a number of uh, best-selling books. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few, End of Poverty, uh, The Price of Civilization. I'm also going to mention the book, The Age uh, of Sustainable Development, that was published in 2015. And there's a curiosity uh, about this book. Uh, the very first global edition was in Serbian and was published here in Serbia by CIRSD. And then the second one was published in America in English and then all around the world. Uh, he's widely considered to be one of the world's leading experts on uh, sustainable development, macroeconomics, and fight against poverty. His work has taken him to more than 120 countries around the world. Uh, and for more than 30 years, he has advised dozens of heads of state and government of, and on economic strategy. Uh, worked with not only the UN, but many other international organizations, including the African Union, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, many others. Uh, he was a crucial advocate of uh, Millennium Development Goals that were formally promulgated in the year 2000, uh, and since has been widely considered to be the leading academic scholar and practitioner on the MDGs. He chaired the World Health Organization Commission on Macroeconomics and Health. Uh, he was the leading force working with the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to design and launch the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria uh, back in 2001. Uh, recipient of many awards and honors, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he has received 24 by now honorary degrees around the world. Um, graduated from Harvard, got his PhD from Harvard. Uh, he became, at the age of 25, assistant professor at Harvard. At the age of 28, if I believe, tenured professor, making him one of the youngest professors in Harvard's history. He was also at Harvard, speaking about Harvard, he was uh, uh, the founder of the Master's in Public Administration and International Development Program, which um, I also uh, attended in, uh, at the beginning of this century. Uh, he was my director of studies and in, in so many ways my mentor, uh, not only at Harvard, but also afterwards. Uh, I was privileged to have Jeff as my advisor when I served as president of the UN General Assembly. He was also a crucial member of my campaign team for <laughs> Secretary General of the United Nations, which almost ended well. But, uh, but then we would have probably not be here this afternoon. So uh, please join me in warmly welcoming to Belgrade Professor Jeffrey Sachs.
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a great, uh, great chance to be with you today. Thank you for coming out in an afternoon to talk about international subjects because it's really important and it's not so usual. And I think Vuk would agree we don't often uh, see a, a crowd uh, of uh, such interested and enthusiastic people. So I'm, I'm really very, very thankful, thankful to you, Vuk, that uh, we have uh, this opportunity and also this issue of Horizons and we have a lot to discuss. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Let's uh, let's go straight. Uh, let's go straight to the discussion. And the the, the leading uh, theme of uh, the latest issue of the Horizons uh, is the geopolitical confusion, and uh, and we're also questioning uh, how long can this last. Now, one can spend all day arguing as to how did we come to this point and uh, what are the main issues, but uh, but arguably. Uh, the most consequential global player was, is, and will for a while, and probably a long while, remain the United States of America, your native America. And I know that uh, you've been an outspoken critic of uh, the current uh, administration and the president in particular, so I think uh, no uh, amount of diplomatic savvy is going to be able to hide this from coming across as transparent, so I want to apologize in advance to uh, American Ambassador Kyle Scott, who had kindly agreed to, to join us this afternoon, uh, but this is an academic discussion. But I gotta start off by, uh, so, so something really struck me this uh, afternoon as we had lunch. We, we were like scrolling to the Washington Post front page and about like 15 out of 20 leading articles were about Donald Trump, uh, so, uh, how did it happen? How, how did it all come about? Why do you think uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, went from the back and defeated all odds and became American president? We're trying to figure that out. <laughs> uh, these things happen. Um, and I think uh, when you talk about the confusion of global politics, it's interesting that Three years ago, we had uh, big agreements, actually, worldwide on two big topics. And it seems a long time ago that we had worldwide agreements. But in September 2015, the world agreed on sustainable development as the shared concept for how to engage, collaborate, uh, organize our activities for the period to 2030. And Vuk, as president of the General Assembly, played a very big role in that because it was a process of UN negotiation of getting an agreement among 193 countries. And the agreement that was reached by acclamation on September 25th, 2015, is a very wise global agreement that we should work together to fight poverty, fight environmental degradation, uh, promote social justice, uh, promote uh, jobs, decent jobs for young people, and so on. And then a few weeks after that, the world reached an agreement unanimously again, same 193 UN member states on the Paris Climate Agreement. That was December 12, 2015. It looked like the world was on a path of actually cooperating and agreeing. And to reach those agreements, China and the United States were walking arm in arm into the Paris Climate Agreement, saying this is something that we're going to do together. It's amazing, two and a half years later, the confusion that we're in. Nobody's walking arm in arm. Everybody is in battle. We have this so-called beginning trade war underway. The president of the United States calls Canada our great threat. You can't even make this up. If it were in a satire, you would say it's too unrealistic to be funny. But suddenly, within a couple of years, everything is on its head. 
Britain is leaving uh, Europe. Uh, Europe itself is uh, completely divided right now. So this is really the puzzle of, first of all, why, and that I know is our topic, but how does it unravel so fast? And unfortunately, we're in a part of the world that understands that well, uh, because you've seen unraveling many times. And one thing you know better than almost any other place in the world is that when you see things start to unravel, don't count on them just getting better quickly. Because often we hear, well, sometimes things need to get bad before they get better. But this region knows sometimes things get bad until they get worse. And so I'm very worried about the situation globally. I find it alarming. And we don't have room for an accident because we're armed up to such power that you can destroy any place basically in a half an hour. And that's really what we're, what we're facing. So the, the basic answer to your question is that things happen, and uh, mistakes happen, and Donald Trump is a mistake. Uh, he's a danger to the United States, and he's a danger to the world. Uh, why exactly it happened? Uh, it happened because it's easy to inject fear in people. This is, again, a lesson of this region. Donald Trump ran on a campaign saying that the United States was being ruined by Mexican rapists, by Muslim terrorists, by Chinese uh, tricksters. And uh, a lot of Americans believed him. Not a majority, by the way, not even close to a majority. But the way our elections work, you don't need a majority. Only 56% of Americans voted. He got 2.1 million votes less than Hillary Clinton. But because of the electoral college rules, maybe because of Russian meddling in the elections, which pushed some votes, because of uh, her being an absolutely terrible candidate uh, and not very likable even to her supporters, he got in on the narrowest of margins. But you know that someone like that can cause tremendous damage. He can't really pass much legislation. The only legislation that he was able to pass was a favor to his billionaire friends of giving tax cuts to the richest Americans and opening up a budget deficit. That's what these populists do. They spend your money and my money for the sake of their friends and for the short term, it looks OK until you run out of money and then you have a disaster. So that's, that's yeah. the, the first part. But the second part is that he is, he's in charge of our foreign policy. So he's making battles that didn't exist. He's inventing problems that didn't exist. Why are we in a trade war with Europe, for God's sake? Why are we in a trade war with Canada and Mexico, for God's sake? Why are we in a trade war with China? The answer, no reason, none at all, except that he is not mentally stable. Well, uh, he was very, very diplomatic until, until, this, until the end. <laughs> and I knew that I, should have, that I should have cut you out a little <laughs> earlier. Uh, but, uh, but look, uh, the economy seems to be booming. Yeah. Under Trump, I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, at the stock exchange, uh, if you look at the markets, if you look at the overall business sentiment in the United States, uh, it doesn't look so bad. So how do you how do you reconcile this? Uh, market economies have business cycles. We're uh, at uh, at the top of the peak of a business cycle. After the 2008 financial crash, which started uh, September 14th, 2008, we had a very deep uh, depression because, or not depression, but we had a real collapse because of, a, again, an incredibly stupid decision. I have to use technically sound terms uh, to be accurate. An incredibly bad decision 
of our Treasury Secretary then, Hank Paulson, who wanted to teach a lesson to a competitor firm of his, to Lehman Brothers, because he was the former head of Goldman Sachs. Different Sachs, by the way. Uh, I'm sure if there were a relation, I'd be talking very differently. Uh, but um, he wanted to teach a lesson to a rival company. He said he wanted to teach a lesson to the markets of responsibility. So he forced Lehman Brothers one day into bankruptcy, September 14, 2008. If he had asked me, I would say, you don't do those things. Those cause financial panics. You don't want a financial panic, Mr. Treasury Secretary. But he didn't know. And so he made a financial panic that engulfed the whole world. And we had a disastrous three years, which would not have happened but for that dumb mistake. We would have had a recession, but we would not have had the kind of global loss of trillions of dollars of wealth that we had. Well, it's taken now many years to recover from that. And mainly, all of the central banks in the world turned on the liquidity spigot. So my teacher, Janet Yellen, uh, became Fed chairman. She was the one who taught me macroeconomics. And she already told me 45 years ago, in such a crisis, you basically pump up the money supply. And that's what she did. Mario Draghi pumped up the money supply in the Bank of uh, Japan. Uh, Mr. Hirohiko Kuroda pumped up the money supply. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, Bank of England pumped up the money supply. And so we made a recovery everywhere, actually. And that was basically the right thing to do. In the midst of this, Donald Trump became president and said, look how great my economy is. OK, he's in a, he's, he's in a business cycle, a positive part of the cycle. Then he added one thing, which definitely gives an extra boost, which he gave a one and a half to two trillion dollar tax cut of money that we can't afford away to very rich people. That improved their mood. If you give $2 trillion to rich people, they feel happier for a little while, because they like money. You know that. That's why they're rich. Mm -hmm. So that added to the boom. And, but one lesson of economics is that I learned. It took me a while, because I was trained in boom-bust economics. So I was trained about the business cycle. Don't focus so much on three months or six months. Take a view, five years, 10 years, 20 years. That's what determines whether we're well off or not. And I don't care that we're at a boom or not. He keeps saying the stock market, it's record high. Yeah, wait until it falls, uh, until we're not at the peak, but we're in a new recession, until his trade war does something completely stupid. So short-term policies are not a they're not interesting, actually. They're not interesting for us intellectually, but that's what 95% of our reporting is about. If you ask me, is he doing anything for the real rebuilding of America? Nothing. Because he's driving us into more debt. He's driving us into trade conflicts. This builder of ours as president hasn't built one thing in the United States. And I don't expect to see one kilometer of new infrastructure, because to build something, you need an attention span, which he doesn't have clinically. Well, uh, let, me, let, let, me, let me now shift to American foreign policy, because this is something that uh, yeah. is very interesting uh, for us here in this part of the world, well, probably for the whole of the world. Um, well, and let me now try to, to balance this, and let me try to be a Trump's advocate a little bit. Uh, a, <laughs> Good luck. A, a, lot of people, a lot of people are saying that uh, Trump has brought you know, unpredictability uh, into America's foreign policy. But, uh, but if you look uh, from a different angle at it, uh, one can also argue that Trump was actually very, and has been, and is very predictable. Because he is doing exactly what he had promised to do uh, during the elections campaign. 
uh, you know, you and I may think that uh, withdrawing from the climate treaty is a bad thing, or withdrawing from Iran nuclear deal, both you and I wrote about this, uh, is a bad idea, or that uh, moving an embassy to Jerusalem, uh, United States embassy to Jerusalem is a bad idea, or imposing tariffs is a bad idea. But actually, this is what he promised to the American people. And American people elected him to do just that. Now, he's doing it. Now, uh, can we call, is it, is it a fair assessment to say that uh, US foreign policy is unpredictable, especially if one has this perspective on things? I wouldn't say that uh, unpredictability is the, uh, it, is is the vice of Donald Trump. I think the points you're making are, are valid ones. Bad judgment is the problem. Presidents, by the way, don't get elected because they promise this or that. They get elected because people vote for them rather than for their opponent. And when there are 100 issues, we don't vote on individual issues. And Americans disagree with almost all the things that you just mentioned. Americans did not want to get out of the climate agreement. Americans did not want the tax cuts. Americans did not want to get out of the Iran agreement. That we know by opinion surveys. But elections are not opinion surveys, and they're not even votes about particular issues. They're votes between two not so good choices. One, a terrible choice, and the other, a not so good choice. And so, they chose the terrible choice. But they didn't even, by the way, I told you, he didn't even get a majority of the votes. So he got something like 27% uh, of the vote. That's not the American people. That's 27% of the eligible voting population or you the voting age You can do a lot with a 27%. No, but that's we, the, we, know, we know here in right, Serbia. But that's, that's <laughs> the point. So I don't, I don't think this is really about American public opinion. But what you're saying is right. He said a lot of the things that he's doing. It doesn't make them less dangerous because he said before. You know, Hitler said what he was going to do. He wrote about it. He published it. It didn't make him justified. He didn't say, I told you so. I'm not making a, an analogy in, in the literal sense. But I am saying that consistency is not really the virtue. What we want is wisdom, decency, ethics in our leaders. We don't care whether they're consistent so much or not if they're doing terrible things. There are many consistently terrible leaders. So. I want leaders who are responsible. And I know that elections are a very fragile barometer anyway, because as I'm saying, first, it's only a choice of two people. Second, it's not at all about policies in particular. Or you don't know even which one's it about. Maybe he won because he scared Americans uh, enough about uh, Mexican rapists and uh, Muslim terrorists, which was a uh, a way that a demagogue speaks. So I don't, I don't think Americans voted on these other issues. They don't even agree with these opinions. But the fact is, he's putting us in a lot of danger, in my opinion. Now, there is something beyond Trump that should be emphasized, because there are a, a couple of things to keep in mind about our world. One is that American power, in relative terms, is diminishing no matter who's president. And that's because of the rise of China. That's because of the rise of other parts of the world, because technology is being shared everywhere, because what was American economic dominance is no longer so dominant anymore. As a share of the world economy, we were probably, depending on exactly how you measure it, around 30% of the world economy at the end of the 1940s, and now we're probably about 15 or 16 percent of the world economy. Big, but not overwhelming. China was about 2 percent of the world economy. Now it's about 17 percent of the world economy, bigger than the US in total size, of course, with four times more people, so only one over four in per person terms. But this means that geopolitically, the 
era of American leadership is over anyway. We're now in a multipolar world. That's hard to adjust to, and it's very hard to adjust to for the American foreign policy establishment and also the American psyche, because we believe we run the world, or that's what we're told. America doesn't run the world. It shouldn't run the world. It can't run the world. But the foreign policy establishment, even now, still thinks it does. Who should govern here? Should this government stay here? Who told you? Whose choice is that? So that's a deeper problem that, than just Trump. And I was quite a critic of the Obama foreign policy, you know. And I voted for President Obama twice. And compared to this guy, my God, you know, he's a saint. But he made so many bad mistakes, which were not just personal errors, but the way our foreign policy works. He wanted to overthrow Assad in Syria. Well, well what right? I know we'll come to this, but no right, and it was a disaster. Six years on, it's been an ongoing proxy war. He wanted to, he participated with another crazy idea of Sarkozy that we should kill Gaddafi. And so we did that. Stupid idea. I mean, nasty. Wrong. That's Obama. That's the nice one. Let's, uh, let's go back. Let's go back to that when we, when we address uh, the Middle East. I mean, I'm, I must admit, I was also a, a big fan of President Obama. Uh, I mean, I wasn't voting in the American election, but I was a big fan of Obama before he vetoed me for Secretary General. <laughs> but still, I think we, we, it, it's argu it was arguably a somewhat easier time uh, back then than we have now. But, uh, but you did raise China, and that's obviously uh, the biggest, uh, I would say, um, success story in poverty alleviation in human history, uh, going back from a very, very low uh, base to, uh, to something that is spectacularly high. Now, China is also a, uh, I would say, deeply consequential player in global affairs. And, uh, and there is a lot of uh, discussion right now about uh, the near term and the midterm uh, trajectory of China, economically speaking. Uh, I'm not nearly as competent uh, an economist to debate it, but uh, what's your take? Uh, you go, tra you travel often to China. You work closely with the Chinese government, especially the economic development team. So, uh, what's your bet, short or long, on China's uh, economic trajectory in the in the let's say next five years? Look, China is a uh is uh, an amazing place for us, for the world, for any place in the world, because it's now the world's largest economy. It still develops rapidly. It has become, just within the last 10 years, a technology powerhouse. So the new technologies will come strongly out of China, still out of Europe and the US also, but China will be a technology leader, not just a technology user. That's partly why the US is so freaked out, actually. Because as long as China was assembling iPhones, that was OK. But when China said, we're going to be leaders in artificial intelligence, robotics, semiconductors, we're going to be producing the electric vehicles that you're going to be driving, we're going to be leaders in renewable energy. And they made a list of 10 in the so-called Made in China 2025. That's when all the lights started flashing in the US establishment. How dare they? Who the hell do they think they are? And that's, that is the biggest anxiety in the US that Trump plays on, actually, even more than all these terrible people these, by the way, impoverished mothers and children trying to escape violence and drought in Central America that Trump calls murderers. 
They're not murderers. They're poor. They're displaced. They're trying to flee from violence. And he puts their kids in cages, which shows just how dangerous the situation is right now, because we don't have a safe guarantee that this is uh, going to have a, a quiet outcome. But the thing that moves a lot of uh, even the foreign policy establishment is China's rise. Do I think it's real? Yes. I'll give you one little illustration why I think it's real. My wife, who's uh, here with me, Sonia and I were even 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, we were in the middle of a metropolis that looked like downtown Manhattan to us. Skyscrapers, neon signs, fancy stores that we couldn't afford. We were walking around one evening in, in China, in Western China, and I said to my wife, you know, this morning we had never even heard of this city before. And for me, the point was there are a hundred cities of a million or more people in China. And you go to them today and they've got booming downtown areas and they have fancy shops and they have people outside in their restaurants and they're not all thinking about the United States every moment. They're living a life of tremendous uh, prosperity and they've earned it by working extremely hard, saving a lot, building for the future, and there still is momentum in that. Now, it's also true, no one has ever grown economically, no country has grown economically the way China has for as long as China has. And when you're saving 40 or even 50% of your national income for investments every year, you can make mistakes, you can overbuild apartment complexes, you can have real estate bubbles, so they will have fluctuations, they will have ups and downs. But my guess is that they will be prosperous, technologically dynamic, and important for the world. And I say, thanks God, why not? This is great. Uh, this is the country, the civilization that gave us most of our big technologies for about a thousand years from 500 AD to 1500 AD. We learned uh, how to do printing press and unfortunately gunpowder and also the compass and a hundred other innovations that came from east to west. Then for 400 years or 500 years it went the other way. Now we're gonna enjoy some benefit of some new technologies coming to us from the other direction. And I think that this is good for the world. But let me, uh, let me point uh, your attention to the big uh, infrastructure project that, uh, that has caused a lot of uh, uh, locomotion globally, I would say, and that is the Belt and Road Initiative. This is the China coming out of uh, its borders and now trying to invest all these big savings uh, in building infrastructure that would connect uh, Far East and, and Europe for now, but there is a lot of uh, fear and there is a lot of uh, suspicion around the world. Uh, is this about uh, China's quest to project power? Is this about controlling of the Eurasian mass? Uh, a lot of states, including here in Europe, are highly skeptical about the Belt and Road, about the uh, environmental practices and so on and so forth. So what's your take on the Belt and Road? And, uh, uh, and is it going to take off, given all the, uh, I would say, political opposition in some important quarters to it? I think it's a, you put it very well, which is that China grew, and then it starts to spread out uh, in its business and its capital investments. And that is true. And if you think about modern economic history, which means the history of the last two centuries in the world. That's the period of the industrial age and now the digital age. Of course, the first industrial revolution was in England and the first outward mass investment was by the British Empire. And so when you develop a lot of capital and a lot of technology, you, you look for foreign markets, definitely and also to facilitate the outward investment of your businesses 
As a government, you invest in infrastructure as well. After World War II, that's what American companies did. The U.S. government financed the Marshall Plan or financed investments in infrastructure in other places and made a good home for American foreign investment. McDonald's everywhere, Ford Motor Company everywhere, GM plants everywhere. That's what you do. This is what is economically happening with China right now, which is China's become the world's largest economy. It's got a surplus of saving because they save a lot building for the future. One reason they need to save a lot, by the way, is that they're aging rapidly because of the one China policy. One and child the, policy. One child policy. Sorry, one child policy. They also have a one China policy, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but the one child policy. And uh, they need to save for retirement. They're going to be old by mid-century and a median age not as old as me, but uh, a median age of uh, 50 or so. And so they're saving for, saving for their future. Now, the question is, is this a benevolent, a malevolent, or what kind of force is this? Economically, the tendency would be to say this is a mutual gain because China helps build new technology, expands the world economy, that can, logically speaking, be win-win. If it's done in an imperial manner, it's not so much win-win. It's I win, you lose. And like, when I, it's I win twice. And it, I yeah. win twice. And yeah. when it was the British Empire, I don't think it did so much good for the recipient countries. But I personally don't believe China is an empire could be an empire or desires to be an empire. They're going to be too old to be imperial anyway. 50-year-olds are not empire makers, truly. And we're past, I believe, we're past the age of empire. People try still, even locally and globally, but all they do is create wars. They don't create empires anymore because there's too much countervailing power everywhere. People are smart. They don't want to be ruled by somebody else. And so I don't believe that China could be an empire, even if it wanted to. But I don't even think they want to. I think they want to be prosperous, powerful, influential, but not in imperial power. So I'm much less worried about it. Now, of course, if you call someone all the time evil and threatening, and you say, we're going to do you in, we're going to contain you, you bring out the worst in the other side. So these fools in the White House, like uh, Peter Navarro, who is the, the trade advisor, and I'm ashamed to say, Vuk, he's a Harvard PhD, though I cannot believe it. I don't know how it happened. Some of us, some of us go Ori, yeah. But look, every day, if you read his books, which are like junk novels, uh, you say, he says, if you buy something from China, you're just strengthening the Chinese military power. So if you set up something as us versus them, be sure you're going to make the other side very radical. Be sure of it. That's the logic of cooperation or fighting. If you are belligerent, you will find belligerence on the other side. You'll make it. That's the danger. I don't believe China's going out to punch its neighbors or the world in the nose. But if the United States is so stupid to call China what it calls it now, literally in the foreign policy documents of the Trump administration, a power that wants to undermine global values, well, if you say this, you will provoke the biggest nationalists in China to say America's a threat. It's not just another power. It's a threat to us. And suddenly we'll have a spiral of escalation of distrust of an arms race and then a disaster. So and so that is the big, big risk we face right now. And if I just might say, because you're in the neighborhood that, uh, that, that knows <laughs> We were yesterday in Sarajevo. It's, you know, it is unnerving to be in the hotel right next to where the car is sitting 
for the tourists to see where the Archduke was shot. And we know, because Vuk hosted a remarkable conference a couple of years ago on 1914-2014, I guess it was four years ago now, yep. uh, all the historians looking back cannot really explain World War I. Because we know it was boom, 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 suddenly a war and then a hundred years of disaster. Because it was a hundred years now, we're still in World War I in a lot of ways. We can't get out of it. And that was because of this tit for tat escalation. Not a deep cause, because there was nothing really to fight about. But if two sides say they're going to fight with each other, you end up with a fight. And that's what happened. So and that's why this is so dangerous right now. China is not our enemy. There's no reason to think of China as our enemy. The right thing to do is to think that China has every bit of right to live at the same living standards as the US or anyone else. And if they're good and smart and productive and save a lot and innovate, God bless them. And don't make an enemy out of them. And that, I think, is, is really the key. So what, uh, in the context of, uh, when, since you were mentioning the, the outbreak of the First World War and, uh, and how it can all unravel, uh, with just one uh, gunshot, uh, I can't. Uh, and, and and this is occupying most of the world's attention right now. I'll I'll divert to the Korean Peninsula, where both China and America are very significant players. Uh, well, what do you make out of this uh, sudden uh, outburst of uh, goodwill diplomacy and? Uh, uh, marching towards what seems to be some kind of an understanding on denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, number one, do you think this is real? Do you think that they are going to succeed in striking a nuclear deal with the North Korea American administration? And if they do, who is going to be the biggest uh, beneficiary of this, if it, for example, entails security guarantees to the north, uh, part of which would be a withdrawal of American troops from South Korea. This uh, meeting and th this uh, period of uh, improved rhetoric and relations is definitely a good thing for us compared to a year ago. Uh, definitely. So as long as it lasts, fantastic. Has anything really been agreed upon? Of course, I don't know. I don't think any of us knows. Uh, I doubt it. But I like this situation a lot better than six months ago. Uh, if everybody believes something's been agreed upon, that'll take us some way without a war for a while. The real issue, the fundamental issue is, uh, well, I don't know if it's the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is there shouldn't be a war, and especially a war between uh, two nuclear powers, because such a war could be the end of everything, and not just for the Korean Peninsula or Guam or Hawaii or any place else, but for everybody, because once this starts, there's probably no end to it. And believe me, as human beings and the systems we have, we're stupid enough to do it. And the more you read history, the more you find we're stupid enough to do it. And a very good book you might want to read is by Daniel Ellsberg called The Doomsday Machine, because he's famous not only for releasing the Pentagon Papers, but he was a young, brilliant analyst of the nuclear standoff with the Russians 60 years ago, almost 60 years ago. And what he saw was terrifying how close to accidental war we came. And it's worth reading this book because it's a memoir of showing- You also wrote a book on this. I wrote a book also on a different period, which was after the Cuban Missile Crisis, how President Kennedy made peace with the Soviet Union to sign the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And it's my whole philosophy 
that in any situation, you can't say, is this a belligerent situation or is this a cooperative situation? That is not dictated by the objective conditions. That is dictated by the accident of the attitudes of the two sides. Because conflict is self-fulfilling to an important extent. If you believe the worst, you get the worst. If you try to conjure the best, you can get the best. But just a tactical question, whether North Korea has nuclear weapons or not is, is an important issue. It's not the decisive issue. The decisive issue is whether nuclear weapons are ever used. That's by far the most important question. But in, a tactical question is whether a country can violate the international norms and become a nuclear power and stay a nuclear power? Well, the answer is yes, because it's happened now on several occasions. India, Pakistan, and Israel are three countries that have done that already. North Korea would be the fourth such country. Per se, that would not be a disaster, but it would be a riskier world for sure. Now, the US wants to force North Korea or press North Korea to denuclearize. Is that feasible? The problem is that forcing a country to denuclearize is impossible safely, impossible. So it would have to be agreed. North Korea would have to say, I feel good enough about what's on the table so that I give up the nuclear weapons and uh, reap the benefits. Unfortunately, what's on the table is intrinsically unsatisfactory to some extent because many countries have given up nuclear programs often to have disaster follow. And three of them are Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, and Ukraine. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons under a peaceful agreement and, of course, ended up facing what it did. And uh, Saddam gave up his nuclear program. Whether George Bush believed it or not, we don't know whether it was cheating or lying or just uh, completely irresponsible, but it was at least irresponsible, went to bomb the regime and overthrow it supposedly on the threat of the nuclear weapons that didn't even exist, but it obviously didn't give Saddam Hussein much safety. And Gaddafi in 2007 famously came in from the cold and said, OK, I want to make peace and uh, I want my children to go to the best schools in Europe and the United States and we'll have good relations and we'll do all the rest. And then four years later, they decided to kill him. So that's not so convincing. Where's the trust on that? That's why I really dislike regime change as a foreign policy of the United States, which is almost an addiction of the US. And that's not a partisan statement, and that's not even Trump. This is all the earlier regimes. I don't like using our bombing, you know it here. I don't like using our bombing to force political decisions. I like diplomats like this guy. Uh, because diplom <laughs> because diplomacy is is the grown up way. Bombing someone is the playground way except doing it in a sandbox you kill people. And so that's the big difference. And now what is uh, the North Korean regime to think of all of this? Are they really going to do it? It's possible. Maybe, maybe the deal in the end is uh, that China gives the complete security guarantee so the US wouldn't even dare because there's a China security guarantee. And then uh, denuclearization takes place. That's possible. Uh, and that would be mutually good. And it would expand China's uh, influence in Asia. And to my mind, that would be OK, too. So that is one conceivable way that this could actually happen. But there's no way that the United States, by saying, uh, we're going to reduce you to rubble, like Trump was saying last year, can threaten anyone 
to give up nuclear weapons. All they do is harden your view to keep them. Are you kidding? When you have someone saying those things, you give them up, and then you know you're going to be bombed on the head. So oh. that, that's why this is a much better approach. But the only one that could conceivably guarantee it would be China. Uh, so uh, well, w one can also argue, well, Trump was certainly arguing that uh, he's a tough talk. Uh, last year at the United Nations has actually led to developments that we have now in which there's a hope. But by the way, coming to, even to, to an agreement. that could be, by the way, but whatever happened, even with the tough talk, maybe it did. It did not lead to denuclearization. Tough talk will never lead to denuclearization. It will lead maybe to a summit meeting. Trump loves summit meetings, by the way. This guy is so hungry for publicity, you cannot believe it. So he had the whole world watching him for a whole day. This was the happiest day of his life. I, I, I also, I, I can think of some other people who have same, who have same things. But look, uh, your entire piece for Horizons was, uh, was uh, on, uh, on the Middle East. And uh, and the very sad state of affairs, very very difficult to to trace it back as to how it started and and why are we uh, at the stage where we are? It's it's disaster for Syria. It's disaster for Yemen. Libya is not uh, not not much better. Uh, but uh, what is it that one can do about it? And let's start from America, the most powerful militarily, most powerful player in the region and globally. Uh, what is it that America can do right now? Don't, for, don't think about the mistakes of the past or good things of the past. From now on, if you were to advise President of the United States about the Middle East, what would you advise him to do? I would say that the uh, interventions of outside powers in the Middle East for the last hundred years have not only not solved any problems, but have been a continuation of problems again and again. And uh, Britain and France made a mess of the Middle East after the Versailles Treaty. And then the United States took over the imperial role after 1950. And we've not done better. We've constantly overthrown governments. We've constantly stoked wars. And we've not solved any problems. It's all been using power for the interest of uh, various kinds of interests uh, involved. But it's been the deployment of military power. In 1979, the US wanted to provoke a war in Afghanistan. We know it from Zbigniew Brzezinski describing how the CIA went in in order to trigger the unrest to pull the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan. Well, you could say, quote unquote, it worked. And Afghanistan has now been at war for 40 years. Some success. Brzezinski says, well, it was a price worth paying it brought down the Soviet Union. Some success. The Soviet Union could have been a peaceful partner of the United States. Things could have evolved peacefully. But Afghanistan ended up 40 years in war. Now the United States uh, made a war in Iraq. The country remains unstable. Then in 2011, the US, <coughs> Hillary Clinton and uh, convinced President Obama on, on uh, the encouragement of Mr. Sarkozy and Mr. Cameron to bomb Libya. Now we have instability there for the last seven years. An and then Syria, the United States tried to overthrow Assad, probably the CIA, which is the most unsuccessful operation I, agency I know of in US government history. More blunders on it, not its intelligence side, by the way, but on its secret operation side. 
uh, which is a disaster. We should not have a secret army in the United States. But they probably told President Obama, don't worry, he'll fall in 30 days. And that was seven years ago. And we've ended up with 10 million displaced Syrians, a European refugee crisis, which has upended European politics. So you ask me what to do. I say all of that as a preface to say we need to pull out the military, the CIA, and so forth. We need to empower the UN Security Council. That means agreeing with Russia. That means agreeing with China. That means agreeing with the rest of the Security Council, that the Security Council is pushing the local powers, which are real and have interests, to work it out. Iran, powerful, important, regional interests, the Arab region, Saudi Arabia now, because of uh, Egypt's foreign policy weakness, the leader, is also proximity, and Turkey, all important. But all three of them need to understand nobody wins in this. There's no battle to the end. Whereas everyone thinks, the Saudis think, oh, we have the US on our side. We can beat the Iranians. The Iranians think, oh, we have Russia on our side. We can beat the other side. This is crazy. You can't win in this region. This is the same populations. You know it well. You've been fighting each other for a long time. You don't win in the end. You know, you only restore peace. There's no winning. It's just people needing to live together. And nothing's wrong with the Iranians that they're the evil enemy number one. That's baloney. There's no historical cause for that. And that they're the leading terrorist nation in the world. That's absurd, by the way. Almost all the terrorist attacks are Sunni attacks. Almost none are Iranian attacks. And for a reason, by the way, the Shia structure is hierarchical. It starts with the supreme leader. He's not He's not making terrorist attacks that way. What Americans don't like is that in 1979, we had a hostage crisis. So the memory was really a post-traumatic stress syndrome. And also because Iran does not accept Israel and wants some kind of arrangement. And so for the United States, this is about Israel. OK, you can defend Israel, but you don't have to call Iran, the number one terrorist threat in the world, that's ridiculous. It's not in any objective way. And Israel needs to compromise. Why doesn't Israel compromise on anything? Nothing. Because of two things. One, it has nuclear weapons. And second, it thinks the United States will do anything it says. And so Israel doesn't behave decently to its Palestinian population. It shoots massively into young people, killing dozens, wounding 2,500 people. Why? Because it can get away with it, it thinks. It's arrogance. So we need to take away the arrogance to say to all of them, none of you wins. It's, this is, there's no winning in this region. It's living together. The Security Council guarantees your agreement but we take out our secret army, which is the CIA, because we should not have a secret army in a democracy. It's a disaster, a disaster. And we should press you to make peace among yourselves. You tell us the solution. But we will not have, you know how many military bases the United States has all over the Middle East? And by the way, China has one outside military base, as far as I know, a small base in Djibouti, maybe two, maybe one other. The United States has about 750 overseas military bases. And then when China gets one, they say, you see, they're, they're, they're an aggressor. That's a mentality problem. That's just not propaganda. That's a mentality problem. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And now you all understand why we didn't win the race for Secretary General. Why? <laughs> we were the second. <laughs> Jeff was a key guy. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
But it was a hell of a ride. It was a hell of a ride. And no, it was, but, it's, but, it's a good thing to say. It's a good thing to say what you believe is the right thing. But and, by the way, you should be very proud of Vuk and also very proud of Serbia's lead with Vuk in the United Nations. Because even with all the problems of the United Nations, it's by far the best hope we have to stay alive on the planet. And Vuk did a great job. Thank you. Well, I really cannot think of a, of a better note to end the first part of the remarks. Uh, and uh, it's, it's customary here that uh, we turn to the audience for questions. Uh, so uh, questions uh, from the audience for about 15, 20, 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. please. Good evening. Thank you for being here with us today, Mr. Sachs. Uh, you served as a senior economic advisor in post-Soviet uh, Russia during the, the early uh, 90s, during their um, economic transition, so to speak. Uh, so I read a, a handful of your uh, studies where you came clear on all the misconceptions that were going on around um, your role uh, back then. But my question is, uh, now from this point of time, uh, um, why do you think all these development projects and initiatives that you had either failed or never got to be implemented? Thank you. Great. Th thanks a lot. I had a, uh, a realization in the last couple of days. Uh, I was an economic advisor for a number of countries around the world, actually, in the last 30 years. And I had... Uh, several successful experiences, and I had several experiences where uh, I watched uh, what I regard as uh, terrible things happen. And uh, uh, I'm often asked, you know, didn't you give stupid advice and so forth? Maybe yes, maybe no, but let me describe something I realized in the last couple of days. I had two experiences that were quite searing failures in a way uh, as advisor. And one was here, uh, and uh, the other was uh, in Moscow. And they're very, very similar, actually. So you can really understand Moscow by understanding here, because it's almost the same. So at the last moment of federal Yugoslavia, uh, I became, for a few months, advisor to uh, the last federal prime minister, Ante Markovic. And it was a little bit of an accident and a little bit at the uh, end of the story, because uh, I was brought here by Yanis Dronovšek, uh, a wonderful person, uh, to come in September uh, 1989 to Belgrade. And uh, uh, Mr. Markovic wasn't really very interested in seeing me. But in any event, uh, President Dronovšek pressed and forced him. And it ended up our 15-minute meeting turned into an eight-hour meeting uh, to talk about uh, what the economic stabilization would be like. And in the end, uh, he launched a plan, the Markovic plan, January uh, 1, 1990, that I had a lot of input into, it's fair to say. And that plan failed after about six months. And uh, a year later, there was war. And uh, you know the history much better than I do. And you could say, well, Mr. Sachs, your, uh, your ideas were stupid or so on. And here, nobody much says that. I'm not blamed for the end of Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, people know, OK, you were here for a short period of time and so on. And there was a lot of history. Russia was quite similar for me in that the Soviet Union was collapsing, actually, already by 1990. And the revolutions of this region were already sweeping over the republics of the Soviet Union. And at that point, around 1990, 91, Gorbachev's advisor come, came to ask me for help, Grigory Yavlinsky. So I became an advisor to Gorbachev. 
and I helped make a plan in 1991 for how to restore the Soviet economy. And by the way, I was I personally was perfectly happy for Yugoslavia to stay uh, as a federal country, uh, even in retrospect. I'm, you know, it's not my decision anyway, but I don't see whether that would have been better, worse, whatever. And similarly with the Soviet Union, I had no desire, and even in retrospect, no desire that it not be uh, a nation with the strong autonomy of regions. OK, but in any event, I became Gorbachev's advisor. And I made a plan and uh, recommendations, all of which were rejected by the United States in the summer of 1991. And then Gorbachev had his putsch. And Yeltsin became the preeminent force in the fall of 1991. And then Gaidar, Yegor Gaidar, became his advisor. And Gaidar called me. So I went to. Moscow in the fall of 1991. And at the beginning of 1992, the Gaidar plan started. And I had a lot of input into that. And it didn't work. And it didn't work actually in the same way that the Markovich plan didn't work. Now, if you're not my friend, you could say you're an idiot twice. But actually, it's not that. It's a little more complicated. The economics we're good. I know a lot about financial crises, actually. And I always believed that two things were necessary, internal reform and external help. My main message about a crisis is you need help if you're in a crisis. And my main message to the outside world about a country in crisis is be nice. If your child's having a crisis because they misbehaved, I personally don't believe you punish and punish them alone without giving some space for a chance for the recovery. And if a country has misbehaved, and I think the Soviet Union misbehaved, and I don't think that Yugoslavia managed its affairs all that well for a long time, fell into crisis, I don't believe that then the moral judgment is, you did terribly, go to hell. Or Greece, more recently, where I was a failed advisor of two Greek governments. I can tell you all my failures. <laughs> uh, I was trying to help Mr. Papandreou, and I was trying to help Mr. Tsipras. And I went to Germany and said, be nice to them. Oh, why should we be nice to them? They're so lazy. They're so horrible. They cheated. You know, they're good for nothings. We need to collect the debts from them. OK, that's the nastiness that gets us into war. That's the nastiness that creates deep crises. So just to finish, I know I didn't want to go too long into it. Why did the Markovich plan fail? It failed because your nationalist leaders wanted to pull the country apart on the inside. And on the outside, Europe and the US didn't give a damn to try to help Mr. Markovich, not a damn. So the idea that we had of cancel some of the debt, no interest in Germany. Oh, why should we help them? Well, the result. One result was a lot of violence and a lot of damage and many years of suffering economically everywhere. Go to Russia. It was the same thing. Internally, you can imagine Russian politics. Also, the end of empire. People didn't like it very much. We know Mr. Putin has said it was the worst day in, the, in history uh, when the Soviet Union failed. Well, a lot of people felt that. That wasn't my responsibility, that happened. So the mood was bad. The politics were incredibly complicated. The internal divisions were brutal. I wouldn't say it's the most law-abiding society I've ever experienced. <laughs> the corruption was pervasive. But also, the United States had no interest in helping at all, at all. Stupid of us, incredibly stupid. We had the idea because Mr. Cheney was our defense secretary. He went on to be, he went from being our worst defense secretary to being our worst ever vice president. Because he's a hardline instinctively. 
And so he said, this is our chance for unipolar world. So Sachs says, give them debt relief. Are you crazy? We need to, this is our chance to be the sole superpower of the world. So the US was completely uninterested in help. And I went to the Secretary of State of the United States. And I said, Mr. Secretary, I recommended in Poland you cancel half the debt. You helped stabilize the currency. You followed my advice, quote unquote. And Poland's now growing economically. It's stabilized quickly. It's in good shape. And he looked at me and he said, you know what, Mr. Sachs? Even if I agree with your economics, it's not going to happen. It was politics. So this is the real issue here. And I learned all my economics of this from John Maynard Keynes, who you may have heard of, who was the great British economist. At the end of World War I, he was part of the British delegation to the Versailles negotiations. And France insisted on a harsh treaty against Germany, a very harsh peace with big reparations. And Keynes wrote a famous book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, where he predicted that this is so harsh that we will have instability and the rise of some kind of demon in Germany in the future. This will not go well, he said. And of course, he was right, not in a literal prediction year by year, but in the spirit of it. If there's harshness in peace, you won't escape the harshness in return. So that's where I learned my economics. I used to carry that book with me, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. But we're not good at being nice to others. We're not good at learning our mistakes. And the US made a terrible mistake, and I'll just end here, because it's still an ongoing mistake. We wanted to be the sole superpower, and part of that was to expand NATO. It's ambiguous what Gorbachev was told or not told about NATO expansion. He didn't get it in writing, for sure. So NATO first expanded to the frontline states, to Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Czech and Slovak republics at the, after. But then NATO kept expanding. NATO expanded to the Baltics. NATO expanded to Eastern Europe, to the Black Sea, as you know. Then it wanted to keep expanding. And if you know anything about Russian history, you don't propose to make Ukraine a NATO member. How could anyone be so ignorant as to propose NATO membership to Georgia and Ukraine? That's telling the Russians, we surround you. And that is what provoked the Crimean land grab, in my opinion. That's what provoked the instability. That's what turned Putin from a tough cooperator into a new Cold War, because the US didn't know when to stop pressing its advantage. Moreover, starting so many wars in the Middle East of Russian allies and tricking Russia in the UN Security Council in 2011 saying we're going into Libya to protect civilians and then turning it into a regime change to overthrow Gaddafi. That was a cheat. So that's how we made a new Cold War with Russia. This is ridiculous. We don't know when to stop. Well, uh, let's stop here. <laughs> A couple of more questions. Here, in the first row, sorry. Uh, uh, my name is Dimitri Oino, I'm a screenwriter, and I have a question about Donald Trump. Uh, uh, basically, the way you described him is this, uh, he's this rogue guy who came out of the political mainstream and started running the strongest country in the world. Uh, but then again, a lot of states, a lot of politicians abroad were turned into these rogue states. There was created a lot of media pressure about them and so on. Uh, now he had this meeting with Kim Jong-un where he 
actually behaved as if Kim Jong Un was his partner, as if they can negotiate and sort and all of the human rights violations and everything else was sort of forgotten. There was this warmth to their meeting. Do you think that a mainstream politician uh, from the United States that wasn't Trump could actually make such a meeting, could actually go there and act that way? And do you think that maybe in this world where there are, there are a lot of rogue states and there are a lot of rogue politicians, maybe United States actually needed a rogue president because their mainstream politicians were literally unable to have a sit down with all these people that they created bias against? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's my question. You know, in a, in a world of strong men, you say, well, at least I want my leader to be such a strong man. Uh, and so that's what you're arguing, that uh, if you're dealing with counterparts who are also uh, tough, uh, unconstrained, unprincipled, maybe you want your leader to have those qualities. I don't, uh, because I find it too dangerous. I don't believe in the balance of craziness. I don't believe in the balance of power, actually. Uh, I don't believe in such thing as a, a balance of power. I believe in cooperation or the accident of war. And I say that because even when you have a so-called balance of power, it's easy to destabilize a balance of power. And so if the mood is, we don't fight you because we're only afraid of the consequence back, if that's the trigger, which is how in normal, realist, international relations theory, states behave, that they behave basically because they fear the consequences, but there's otherwise no positive principle at work, I think the world will not survive. And there are too many accidents, too many mistakes, uh, if we don't have goodwill, we will end up with bad will. And if we have a president who I believe psychologically is unstable, so I don't view it just politically, I view it psychologically, uh, that's what worries me. I say it not out of glee, by the way, or not out of to make fun or anything else. I really say it publicly, not because it's easy for me, by the way. It makes me worried for myself. Uh, it makes me uh, not feel so great. Uh, it's not a game on my part. I want people to understand that things really can go wrong, and they should not go wrong. The stakes are too high and the weapons are too powerful. Well, that, that, that certainly applies to both big countries and, and small countries yep. when it comes to leadership. Uh, stakes are pretty high for those of us who live in Serbia or in America or anywhere else in the world, but I'll stop there because I'm trying to be a good host and, and diplomatic. And the last question goes to Brent. Brent Sadler. I have a loud voice. No, no, but like uh, in, the, in the back, in the back, in the back, they're not going to be able to hear if you. If I could just take you back a little bit. Good to see you. Good to see you too. If I could take you back a little bit and talk about Russia, which you go on to then, and China. Yeah. If we look at China as sprinkling its magic dust, i.e. investment, in this part of the world and in China, Russia using soft power, particularly in the media. How do you see the play out between China, non-imperial yeah. ambitions, and Russia, which you might consider to have other ambitions, and particularly in this part of the world, which is right in the door of, of Europe, and of course the uh, ever weakening, it seems, uh, cohesion of the European Union? Russia and China are uh, very, very different uh, in uh, world affairs, obviously. Uh, Russia is uh, it's a geographically enormous uh, landmass. It's a powerful country. It has a powerful uh, nuclear arsenal and a powerful military. It's got a lot of very sophisticated people, very sophisticated. 
but it does not have a highly sophisticated and diversified economy. Uh, its population is one is less than a tenth of China's, and it's falling, aging, declining, and basically an oil state right now. So Russia is not economically a global power in any way. It has energy, but the kind of energy it has is not the energy we're going to use in the future. So we will learn soon, I promise you we'll learn soon, that we're getting out of hydrocarbons worldwide. It seems so silly to say it right now, but we are getting out of hydrocarbons because they're too dangerous. And we're going to learn it every year. More droughts, more heat waves, more hurricanes. And I don't know whether the tipping point is 2018, 2022, 2025, 2030, but it's coming faster than we know. Therefore, if I were Russia, I would be trying to build the capacity of the economy by good relations with Germany, with, with uh, China, with uh, Korea, with the United States, uh, to try to make a diversified economy and uh, have the longer term prosperity. Russia's future is not the military colossus using its oil power for global influence, because 10, 20 years from now, that will not even make sense as a formula. China is quite different. China is 1.4 billion people. It will be one of the three technological leaders of the world. Uh, in fact, my view is that Korea, Japan, and China will form an economic union much closer. The idea that the US balances China and Northeast Asia, I also believe is a, an outmoded concept, actually. So I believe that we'll see China, Korea, and Japan as a technology powerhouse of the world, maybe the number one, together with European Union and the United States. And that uh, that will last for a lot of geopolitical uh, power and global weight. And for reasons I explain, uh, I think uh, potentially if we are responsible and we aim for cooperation, it will elicit cooperation on all sides, but with a powerful actor. The West has not been challenged with the equal power for 250 years. Now it's happening. So this is really a big psychological change. And, but it's real. And to my mind, fine, because why should one small corner of the world presume to run the world? So I think that Russia and China are in a quite different circumstance. They're both powerful. Um, by the way, my feeling about Russia, since I worked there and watched and I explained that I wanted a very different approach to Russia all the different years, and I thought that the expansion of NATO and many other things were wrong and the failure to help Russia was a big mistake. When I look at the UN, the US constantly says, we don't need to work, we were not working with the UN, we're always vetoed in the UN by Russia. The truth is, if you look at what Russia has vetoed, it's actually given the United States good advice repeatedly over the last 20 years. These vetoes have not been to stop the superpower, it's been to say, not such a good idea to have a war in Iraq. Not such a good idea to overthrow Libya. In other words, these have been smart advice, not malevolent anti-US stick you in the side advice. But we can't even comprehend that possibility in the US. If we're vetoed, it must be the other side's evil because we know we're good. And that's a mistake of our thinking. And that's why I come back to the Security Council as being a big hope for me. Because I actually think if you could get China, Russia, the US, UK, and France agreeing on things, and generally that means uh, bringing the other 10 along as well, that pretty much 
is a good guess that that's a good thing to agree on, actually. And so I like the consensus approach because I think we're going to be a lot more accurate in our foreign policy. And it's why I believe, just incidentally, that the Iran nuclear deal was an excellent deal. Because China's not stupid. They don't want some lame uh, agreement leading to nuclear arms in Iran in the future. Russia doesn't want a nuclear armed Iran. Nobody does in particular. And so for the US to say it's bad, oh yes, the whole rest of the world thinks it's good, is a kind of paranoid mindset, which comes back to the clinical psychology, not the real politics of it. Well, uh, there, there is certainly going to be uh, more time to discuss Russia uh, this afternoon, because uh, the second panel uh, of today's event is um, actually a discussion of uh, Serbia in the context of uh, geopolitical developments. And here in the Balkans, Russia has always played a significant role. It is, as a matter of fact, uh, also commemorating uh, an important historical event, which is the 70th anniversary of uh, the break of relations between Stalin and Tito which uh, happened uh, on June 27, which is one day from now, 70 years ago. Wow. It was the famous Konminform uh, breakdown. Uh, and uh, funny to say this building, I don't know if many of you know, but uh, this building, Hotel Metropole, was being finished in 1948. And uh, the purpose of this building was to host the global headquarters of Cominform. Uh, it never happened because of the development. But it became the, a great hotel. It did it become a good hotel. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're also uh, thanking our hosts uh, here. They're always doing a great job. So this afternoon, actually in 20 minutes from now, we are going to start a new panel on much more focused on Serbia in the context of geopolitics. So please stay with us uh, if you can. But uh, before that, I want to thank Professor Sachs for this wonderful uh, afternoon. Join me in thanking Professor Sachs for being with us this afternoon.